Okay, so next up we have Axel Brandenburg from Nordida, uh, who's also visiting here at CU Boulder for a couple of years. And he's going to speak to us about turbulent transport, modeling the non-locality in space and time. Thanks, Nick, for introducing my talk. And thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, present uh, our results on this topic. Uh, turbulent transport is important for many applications in astrophysics and geophysics. Uh, I will focus here in particular on how to model this, how to determine the non-locality in transport, and how to actually use it in, in real models. I will focus not only in non-locality in space, but also in time, which means memory effect. I will start with some simple examples that we are all interested in and want to, want to, want to use. And then I focus on some uh, solid results that we have obtained numerically and uh, present some of the remarkable consequences, unexpected consequences. Non-local non transport uh, plays an important role in geophysics. It has been recognized for a long time uh, in the sense that turbulent tr convection, for example, leads to a displacement of passive scalars, not step by step, but sometimes in larger leaps and this has been recognized for a long time and has been used in simple uh, in, in improved prescriptions. Here, for example, the prescription by Roland Stull, um, which, uh, who was visiting at a, at a time when I was at Boulder some 25 years ago. Uh, he presented something which he calls the transillion matrix approach, which determines how uh, particles from one location uh, here is the source. At one particular height, are deposited at a distant destination, which does not have to be equal to where it was deposited. It can be shifted, and this can be calculated numerically. And uh, uh, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, such prescriptions are of tremendous importance and are uh, generally being used in uh, climate and weather prediction models as is also shown here. We have heard a lot. So some of the non-locality can be directly associated with uh, coherent, spa uh, coherent structures. And let me also emphasize, uh, yesterday we heard about non-locality in spectral space. Here we are talking about non-locality in real space. So it has nothing to do with the uh, Kolmogorov cascade and non-locality in that respect, but really with respect to the, the spatial positions uh, in the atmosphere. There's also a connection with an application to what uh, plays an important role nowadays in understanding stellar convection, namely the question of entropy rain. And um, Srinivasan mentioned that yesterday in his talk where he was talking about a small blob that can perhaps uh, descend all the way to the bottom of the convection zone getting strongly compressed, stabilized that way. Uh, again, an uh, obvious example of non-local transport. Here, an old result that uh, is of 2000 with Mark Misch and Ellen Zweibel back then, uh, where we used the transillion matrix approach to determine from convection uh, how material from a certain height, here's the deeper layers, here's the top layers, uh, how that gets deposited at, at later times. So time is increasing in this direction, and we see that most of the results, most of the uh, stuff is being moved, um, uh, is, is ascending uh, directly uh, to the surface, and other stuff also uh, immediately going, going to the bottom of the convection zone. Now, the transillion matrix approach can unfortunately not really be used, at least not rigorously, for doing any prognostics for mod forward modeling. It can be, however, nicely used to understand and classify and describe the flow. Because all it really does is giving you the concentration for a particular realization for which the Green's function or the transillion matrix has been approached, has been uh, computed. Uh, and that is because the, on the right-hand side, there is hidden information that we don't have, for like, for example, the horizontal distribution of the of the tracers. And so this is what is changing all the time, and that's one of the reasons why uh, this transillion matrix approach cannot be directly used for forward modeling. In mean field theory, mean field dynamo theory in particular, 
uh, it has been known for a long time that turbulent transport is always non-local, and it means that the electromotive force in that particular case, and that translates directly to a Reynolds stresses and also passive scalar transport, is not just a product of a turbulent diffusivity and a concentration gradient, or magnetic field gradients, or currents, or the magnetic field itself, but actually a convolution in both space and time. And so this is what we generally ha have to calculate, the kernel that connects the electromotive force with the magnetic field, or likewise the flux with the passive scalar concentration, or the Reynolds stress with the mean flow, or perhaps even the mean magnetic field and perhaps not even linearly. So this is the goal. Before I come into uh, to that, let me uh, talk a little bit about non-locality in time. That really means memory effect, and that means that the, um, that the magnetic field at a previous time begins to have an influence even in the future. And this has been used, although not really rigorously, but rather as an, as an experiment already by Yoshimura in the context of dynamo theory. He did not really find completely new results. He only found that, the, uh, that he could explain perhaps a, a long-term variability, like, for example, Mount Minima. Uh, moreover, it is not based on any turbulent theory, and, um, and therefore, in that sense, it is uh, arbitrary. Non-locality in space also plays perhaps an important role and has been used all the time, again, in some sense uh, somewhat arbitrary because uh, the babcock lightning mechanism is, in fact, in a clear example of non-locality because the idea is that the magnetic field at the bottom of the convection zone might uh, be important in determining uh, the alpha effect and that the alpha effect itself is something that really has to do with the decay of active regions. And so the result, therefore, the alpha effect itself takes input from the bottom, which has a maximum at somewhere deep down in the domain, and gives an output at the top. So clearly a, a, an example of non-locality in space in this case. But in both of these cases, the uh, Yoshimura case and in this case, Again, there's no direct connection with anything we can strictly verify using numerical simulations. So to make contact now with uh, numerical simulations, we use a method to calculate the full turbulent uh, transport coefficients, which are the alpha effect and the turbulent diffusivity, which connect the electromotive force with the mean magnetic field and its curl, in the simplest case. And we will be allowing for non-locality in space and time. But before that, let me explain, first of all, the method. Uh, ignoring, first of all, non-locality, there are various methods that have been used in order to calculate, first of all, alpha, and perhaps even the turbulent diffusivity. One is the so-called imposed field method. One imposes a certain field. One forgets about the current because the imposed field is uniform and measures this one measures electromotive force from the simulation and thereby calculates alpha. Uh, this is limited in the sense that one does not have a way of calculating the turbulent diffusivity. Somewhat improved methods include uh, both coefficients or both um, uh, sets of coefficients because both are in general tensors. Um, after having defined a certain average, we will be focusing on horizontal averages that then depend on only the vertical coordinate. One approach is to use a correlation method where one uses a time series of uh, the magnetic field and the current density and the electromotive force and correlates that in order to calculate these coefficients. Uh, but a much more rigorous method is what is known as the test field method that has been used and introduced in the context of a geodynamo, and however, in that case, originally in this, in this stationary case. That goes back to Schwinner 2005. Let me briefly explain this method. Consider the full induction equation. The electro full electromotive force that consists of both the mean field part, which is capital U with the over bar, and um, which is also this one, and the fluctuation, the lowercase u. And so 
we can now take an average of this equation and obtain then the well-known mean field equation for the magnetic field, which includes an electromotive force from the small-scale field. That is uh, at the crux of this approach. In order to calculate now this, we need to have an equation for the fluctuations. And this we obtain by t uh, subtracting the average equation from the full equation. And the result is written down here. For the linear terms, it, it is, the result is quite straightforward. It's just a small-scale current density. However, for the full electromotive force, it has four contributions. One of them is this one that drops out. Uh, here are the remaining ones, but we have to subtract uh, this term. So th there are, again, four different terms, all of which have to be calculated, and all of which uh, depend on the fluctuating magnetic uh, field or the fluctuating velocity. In the kinematic approach, all that matters is, is the small-scale velocity here, and that's what I will be focusing on in this case. So this is an equation which, is, uh, which involves the small-scale magnetic field. And we can now uh, use this to calculate the response by not calculating the fluctuations for the magnetic field that we have in the simulation, but for any other arbitrary magnetic field. And that is what is called the test field approach. So what we do now is make a cut between here and here, and insert a mean magnetic field, which is here, uh, which is called BQ, uh, B, uh, PQ, uh, which is referred to as a test field. And we have to invoke as many test fields as, it nece as is necessary in order to calculate all the unknown coefficients, alpha ij and eta ij. Let me show you here an example. Take an, as a test field a cosine variation in the x variation, in the x direction. Normally, you will never have this directly from a dynamo simulation, but this approach does not care what happens in a dynamo. It does uh, care about the mathematics. It cares about the equation that we want to solve, generally. And so, inserting this as a test field on the right-hand side, we have um, an unknown, the x component, E1, uh, with an unknown coefficient, an un unknown coefficient alpha 1, 1. We have the derivative of this we here on the right-hand side, which gives a minus cosine. And so we have a new coefficient here. This is a rank 3 uh, tensor, which can be reduced to the rank 2 tensors that we are, in the end, interested in. So now we have two unknowns with one equation. Next, we take another test field. We take the sine and insert this. Now we have... Uh, obtain here the sign. We obtain a new test, uh, uh, test field result, namely E21. Uh, we have the same unknowns, alpha 1, 1, and, uh, and this one, eta 113, uh, but with a different, cof with a different uh, functional result on the right hand side. So now we have two equations with two, uh, two unknowns. And this we can invert. And the, uh, this is the system of equations. And we can invert this for these coefficients, which is written down here. Here's the rank two tensor components rela related to the rank three tensor components. So this is what is called the test field approach. And this works for a, a harmonic test field with a wave number k and is constant at the moment. But if you now want to focus on long locality, we have to realize that the convolution that we are after is actually the same as a multiplication in wave number space. And that is written down here. And so all we have to do is repeat this test field approach, not just for one uh, value of k, but for all the possible values of k, so that you uh, begin to obtain the functional dependence of all the components of alpha as a function of, uh, of k, as is written down here. And this, again, can be uh, turned into a, a corresponding a kernel component. Here are results for the case of numerically simulated turbulence. One typically finds for both alpha and for turbulent diffusivity uh, diagonal tensors in isotropic turbulence, but their wave number dependence follows a Lorentzian profile. That corresponds to an exponential um, function which is written over here after Fourier transforming it, which looks like this. So this is simply the result for non-locality in space. The same can be approached uh, or applied to non-locality in time. All we have to do 
is uh, have a time varying test field and calculate the electromotive force as a function of time. And what we then obtain is both uh, real and imaginary components of the Fourier transform uh, alpha as a function of frequency. And you can do the same thing, not just with uh, sinusoidal variations, but also with exponentially growing ones. It's all equivalent because these are analytic functions. And so in this way, we obtain first the real component and the imaginary component and can assemble everything and uh, fit this result to what, in the simplest case, for isotropic turbulence looks like this. In more complicated cases, it can be more complicated, as is shown also here. There can be additional humps, for example. And so in general, uh, things will certainly not be as simple as this, but uh, often they are also not so different from this one. So now let me apply this to the Roberts flow. Now, Roberts flow comes in four different versions, and therefore there's actually four different Roberts flows. The simplest one is the Roberts one flow. And that one is an example of a fully helical flow, which is quite familiar to most of us. However, there are also other flows in the original paper by Roberts, all of which have the same horizontal velocity components, but different vertical flows. So in that in the cases of flows two, three, and four, the flows are non-helical, whereas in the first case, they're helical. In the first case, we clearly have an example of turbulent diffusivity together with an alpha effect. In the other three cases, we don't have an alpha effect, and yet we have, as we find numerically, large-scale dynamo action. Where does it come from? Already in a paper of the late 80s, it was suggested that uh, the Roberts flow could be an example of a negative diffusivity effect. Now, what does that mean? If the diffusivity is negative, everything must blow up if, you, if I was to impose that into a, in a mean field model. So obviously, this can't be quite as simple. And then, nevertheless, it turns out, using the test field method, and for a given val uh, value of the wave number, uh, as a function of Reynolds number, First of all, the diffusivity eta t at small Reynolds numbers is positive. And it agrees with the second order correlation approximation as it has to. However, if you make the Reynolds number bigger, the sign of eta t changes, becomes negative, and then approaches <coughs> zero again. However, before it approaches zero, it nevertheless undershoots the microscopic diffusivity and is therefore able to overcome microphysical decay in order to lead to a dynamo excitation. So this is a remarkable result. I would not have believed this unless I have seen that with my own eyes. The relation to non-locality is clearly uh, reflected in the fact that this result is strongly wave number dependent. For small wave numbers, the diffusivity is negative. However, there's a jump, and for large values of the wave number, smaller scales, again, the diffusivity becomes positive, as it has to. So this means turbulent transport is always stable at small length scales. However, at large length scales, very large length scales, it could perhaps be unstable in this particular case. So what about the other Roberts flow components, or Robert, other Roberts flow examples, Roberts flow two and three? It turns out, uh, and this is all results in a paper with Matthias Reinhardt, uh, April de Vlaine, and Karl Heinz Redler. It turns out that in these two cases, the turbulent diffusivity is positive. So what is now the answer? How can we have large-scale dynamo action? We know very clearly we do have large-scale dynamo action in these flows. Here is the Bx component, here is the Vy component for the Roberts 2 flow, which is also shown up here. Uh, this is the Roberts 2 flow. Uh, as a function of, of wave number and length scale. And so we see that we have unstable solutions when the wave number is sufficiently small. If the wave number is large, the flow becomes again stable. And so Robert's flows two and three are rather similar in these respects. Uh, they lead to traveling waves. Uh, one difference is that for the Robert's two flow, uh, the f uh, waves go in opposite direction for Bx and By but in the same direction for Roberts flow three. Using now the test field method, it turns out that the turbulent diffusivity is still di at a diagonal tensor. It is positive. However, for
for the Roberts flows two and three, there are off-diagonal components of the alpha tensor. Now, uh, famili people familiar in the subject will know that these components can never lead to a dynamo action. Especially in this case, it simply just corresponds to a turbulent transport. It's like an uh, advection, but without any material transport. In this case, uh, it is like advection, but in opposite directions for the bx and by components. And in fact, it turns out that the equations for bx and by completely decouple. Very unusual dynamo theory, and yet this is a dynamo. The dispersion relation, uh, especially in this latter case here, is for one component simply that the growth rate, p, which can be a complex function, is now given by i times k times gamma, and k is a wave number, minus it mi microphysical diffusivity and the turbulent diffusivity times wave number squared. Now, in general, this result will be um, imaginary. It has a, clearly an imaginary component here and a real component here, so the growth rate has a real part and an imaginary part. However, uh, if we include now non-locality in time, then the result is also dependent on the frequency. And so the frequency we, ha we don't know a priori. We only know once we have the imaginary part of the growth rate, and that we have to stick in in the, in the calculation of the uh, transport coefficients. So we have to do it iteratively. And here's shown the result in uh, various numbers uh, of iterations, and we see that the results converge. And we see that we obtain certain values for the real part of the growth rate, which is here excited, is positive, and a corresponding frequency. And looking back at this t uh, figure, which I showed earlier, uh, one can see that there's excellent agreement with the DNS. Now, how can we understand this result? Um, and this is, remember, uh, the simplified form of non-locality in space and time can be captured by both the Lorentzian profile and this term here, which corresponds to an exponential memory effect in time. Now, this, in turn, can be uh, moved to the left-hand side on the, of the evolution of the equation for the electromotive force. And so we can actually turn the electromotive force into something which originally was an operator, which now turns out to be a partial differential equation with a time derivative and a, and a Laplacian. So it is something that is extremely simple to do, but it is, of course, a simplification. Nevertheless, it captures spatial temporal non-locality and is therefore much, much better than ignoring it altogether. Now, using this approach for our peculiar examples of the Roberts flows two and three, let us try, try it out. Let's put this uh, term into the denominator here, where tau is the memory time. Uh, moving this uh, upstairs as for small frequencies, we clearly see that we begin to have the possibility of a real part by, for all oscillatory solutions. So the growth now depends on the fact that the result is oscillatory. It will never work for non-oscillatory dynamos. Uh, and then the growth rate can become positive if the frequency and correlation times are large enough so that they overcome the positive turbulent and microphysical diffusivities. At the same time, of course, we have to balance the imaginary parts, which leads to this additional constraint. And here is shown a result from the simplified approach, which agrees reasonably well with the original one. But of course, it's not accurate, as we understand. So with this, I can now conclude and say that non-locality begins to become accessible by using the test field approach. And we have seen that non-locality, both in space and in time, can be important. For the Roberts four flow, we have understood the large scale dynamo growth here as a result of a negative turbulent diffusivity effect at small wave numbers. Furthermore, Bx and By decouple, which is quite unusual dynamo theory. For Roberts flows two and three, also the two components decouple, but now turbulent diffusivity is positive, and yet there is a large scale dynamo. And in this case, it turns out that it results from the fact that there is a memory effect. So that means that the electromotive force has no longer an instantaneous connection 
with the magnetic field at that time, but it cares about the magnetic field at all earlier times. This is uh, potentially relevant for understanding the yet unknown or unsolved problem of the solar dynamo, where we have played with a lot of arbitrary approaches in order to make, make at least some pro progress. And here, I've been offering a completely new idea that uh, we need to check uh, and, and see whether it might perhaps be a more fruitful approach. Thank you. Questions? Um, in this area, presumably, these ideas are new. And uh, uh, thank you for introducing them. Uh, but of course, the idea that there is non-locality in time and space uh, in standard turbulence literature has been around for a long time, including a negative viscosities and things like that. Um, specifically, people have used the models which originate from Maxwell model, but it's more complicated. And uh, I wonder if um, I, I see some familiarities, but I can't exactly uh, uh, tell you just looking at this what the connections are. Uh, maybe we could talk about it sometime. Sure. Thank you. So I'm, I'm of course aware of the fact, uh, as I've said also in the beginning, that non-locality in, in time, in space at least, is uh, well recognized. Um, what I have not seen anywhere is that one can actually uh, come up with a it was an evolution equation for the electromotive force instead of using a kernel. Because using a kernel is extremely cumbersome. You have to keep in memory all the previous times. However, by using an evolution equation to first order in time and with a Laplacian, which actually acts like a diffusion term, which is also nice, uh, I've not seen anywhere. And yet, it, uh, this approach does capture um, uh, reasonably well uh, this non-locality non -locality in both space and time. So. A nice uh, summary. I, I'm not, I wasn't aware of this. But in terms of physics-wise, what is your further insight? Why this memory? And by why is it diffusion, well, this direction, do, sure. time? This has to do yeah. with the fact that the uh, turbulence itself um, has it, um, eddies which are not very extremely small. The eddies can become comparable to the extent of the domain. And likewise, in time, we might be interested in phenomena that happen on a time scale close to the turbulent, uh, diffusion, uh, turbulent turnover time, and a little bit longer. And in that case, again, the temporal uh, memory effect becomes important. So this is the significance of this. Conversely, when people use mean field dynamos, uh, dynamo calculations they have, and ignoring this effect, they have sometimes come up with rather sharp structures in space and rather rapid changes in time. Clearly, this must be unphysical because um, the alpha effect would not be able to respond to such spatially uh, sharp structures and uh, localized events in time. But, Uh, show memory, but it's so gentle been, and non memory. I've been considering most of the time force turbulence, um, and for convective turbulence, things are typically much worse, and uh, memory effects become uh, but much more important in our locality and time in space. Hi, Axel. Nice talk. This this evolution equation for the for the EMF. But can you think of this as a Taylor expansion of the kernel for small tor? Yeah, you can think of this like this, yes. Okay. Because uh, there would clearly be higher time derivatives if yeah. you had more complicated time dependencies. Yes, absolutely right. OK, thank you. Like, for example, for that one. Yes, uh, yeah, so for example, this would already, this is a more complicated uh, fit. And then there would be a second time derivative, yes. So it's just, I guess, two things. One was, so the test field method, supposing you go to the non-kinematic non uh, regime. Yes. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes. And I mean, one, one comment that I would have is that, supposing you have a simulation where you can measure the mean fields at the end of the simulation, you can then you presumably use that as use the actual fields as the test fields and back out the. Uh, that typically does not work. You need uh, to have a, a orthogonal set of um, 
It won't be orthogonal. Yes. What, we're not but going. what if you so, so then, about nonlinearity? Uh, this clearly does not work on first principles. However, you can come up with a heuristic approach by which you can simply include now nonlinearity in the usual ways as on the right hand side of such an evolution equation. And yet you would capture a non locality. Whether it is right or wrong, we still need to check, but at least that's uh, worth trying out. Okay, up next we have Fabian Godeford from CNRS. Um, he'll be speaking about multi-scale structure and dynamics of rotating turbulence and roles of waves in anisotropy. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I included a few uh, uh, aspects of, of analogies with uh, uh, MHD because um, there, there's a strong analogy between rotating turbulence and <coughs> MHD turbulence as well, so um, um, that's why I have a few a few points about that. Um, so, so the, the 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 thing I'm going to present is uh, um, is turbulence uh, viewed from um, the point of view of, of um, engineers uh, that try to model uh, multi-scale uh, flows and um, and with distortions, and the distortions can be uh, rotation, stratification, shear, mean flow. Uh, uh, the effect of Lorentz force, etc., um, and um, so we're, we're trying to get some some um, uh, uh, evaluation of the, the statistical mass, um, uh, uh, data um, in in, in um, uh, corresponding to the this multi-scale multi -scale structure, and uh, we're trying to model that and to understand how how we can have simplified models with um, with that. I think this is, is not going to work. Um, so th th the collaboration is is with. People who are uh, have obtained the results in in, in bold face, Alexandre Lache, Mathias Duramatu, and a PhD student of mine, uh, Donato Valifoco, and um, um, and other other people in uh, in 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 my lab and in other labs in in France and uh, and abroad. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, to to give to start with the the uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the description of waves and linear regime. This is a bit obvious to, to most of you, but um, uh, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move on to, to the, the, the weakly nonlinear regime, um, just to describe what, what you can get from, from, from this regime, and, and then the, 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 the complete turbulent case. Um, and the, the, the idea is that um, once we've, we've justified the fact that there's, there's a specific structure of turbulence uh, and a specific anisotropy of turbulence due to the presence of wave, uh, the question is, is, is in, do, do we uh, uh, actually see waves in, in, in fully nonlinear regime and fully full nonlinear turbulence? So, so is, is, is this description, this, this, this initial um, uh, introduction of, of the, 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 the wave regime a, a pretense or uh, an actual uh, feature of the of the uh, of the turbulent flow, um, and I'll, I'll present the the the, uh, the tools that we are using uh, in um, for describing this um, these, uh, these 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 turbulent fields um, at at, uh, at the uh, statistical uh, level, uh, and it, we, we, this is the, the uh, we, we're using the toroidal poloidal decomposition, and we, we're talking about polarization, which is which is um, uh, dedicated to to characterizing an isotropy. Um, and um, uh, especially here, I'll, I'll focus on rotating flows. And the results we have are come mostly from direct numerical simulations at high resolution, like 2,000 uh, cube, 
and um, statistical models that we develop at, uh, in the lab as well. And we compare with experiments that we're not doing here uh, in, in, in the lab, but we, we, we obtain data from, from other labs. Um, so the, the basic point of view and, and the goal um, that, that we're trying to, what we're trying to do is to have a multi-scale characterization of anisotropic turbulent flows. And um, uh, especially we're trying to get um, the, the most um, important features uh, appearing in these flows uh, at the level of simplified models that, that, that can be one-point models for, for engineering applications or two-point models um, um, if we want to describe a, a more advanced structure of the flow. And we are going to try to extend the statistical description of, of turbulence beyond Kolmogorov, which is um, um, uh, applicable for, for homogeneous is isotropic turbulence heat, but um, which is hardly um, uh, applicable to a homogeneous anisotropic turbulence. So we're trying to extend that, this description to, 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 to the anisotropy of homogeneous turbulence. And there's a duality between, between physical space and wave space, and this is difficult because we have to tackle the problem from, from the, the the spectral space, which is which is um, um, uh, let's say easy, because because the uh, the incompressibility condition is is, is um, analytically in, uh, in integrated in this in this in this space, but a physical space description, of course, is important because uh, experiments are carried out uh, in physical space. And um, uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the, the the actual presence of, of wave motion in this. Um, in these flows. So the, the, the presence, well, we, we, we all, we, the, the, the point is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about flows in which rotation, stratification, either stable, unstable, or um, the effect of, of a magnetic field are, are, uh, um, bring a, a specific structure in the flow. But the, the simplification we, we, we're using is an ide idealized flow model in which we have large scale instabilities, we have distortions, and we, we, are, we are talking about basically um, a smaller scale than the synoptic scales that could appear in, in geophysical flows, for instance. And, and we're, we're looking at, at a box of turbulence and um, which is um, either starting from initial conditions and, and we let it decay, or which is forced by, by let's say, large-scale instabilities that could appear in the flow. Um, so in isotropic turbulence, the, the, the picture of the, the flow is like that. We have um, uh, turbulent vortices. Uh, this comes from numerical simulations, and this is experimental. Um, in, um, and um, we adopt the, the statistical multipoint description of, of the flow in which we have a velocity at a given point, and we have a velocity at another point here. So this is two-point description in physical space, and we can correlate um, either the velocity at x and x plus r, or the, 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 uh, the, the in, uh, co compute the, the moments of the increment uh, between the, this velocity here and here. Or we, in, in spectral space, we can use this um, description as uh, in Fourier space uh, to, to, uh, to obtain the spectra uh, uh, for, for uh, the, um, the kinetic energy of the flow. Um, in isotropic turbulence, we have uh, the classical um, results, for instance, the, uh, the minus four fifth law from Kolmogorov theory. This is a version of, the, um, of, the, of this, this law um, uh, under uh, some assumptions. And an equivalent um, thing result in, in spectral space is that the minus five third scaling of the, the, the kinetic energy spectrum. But of course, if you distort this, the, the homogeneous isotropic turbulence, uh, you, you won't get these results anymore. So the question is, is do we get, uh, what, what do we get from that? So um, um, we, we can, we can uh, consider different cases, but I'm only going to consider the rotating case here. Um, uh, I, I, I mentioned the fact that I would uh, um, um, give some, 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 uh, some examples of, of, of flows, conducting flows with, um, uh, with a, uh, an external magnetic field. And so, for instance, the structure of the flow in, in isotropic turbulence is the, 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 I mentioned that the, 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 the vortices here, small-scale vortices, and a box of worms here. But if you add a, um, uh, an external magnetic field, then you have conducting sheets uh, in conducting flow. So the structure here is different. But the question is, for instance, um, uh, if you consider uh, this box of turbulence and you apply the, uh, strong rotation, then you will have uh, struc tr structures elongated along the, uh, the actual direction. And that means the um, integral length scales with, in, will increase in this direction and will be reduced in, this, in, in the horizontal, uh, the perpendicular direction. If you do the same with um, uh, a flow which is submitted 
to an external magnetic field, you will have an increase of the integral length scale uh, uh, as well in the, in the direction of the, the, the axis of the, uh, the magnetic field. Um, but uh, obviously, the structure of the flow is different um, between, between these two cases in retaining MHD flow. Um, and, but, but if you compute only the statistics and the, the increase of the integral length scales, you, you won't see this, this different structure. So uh, the question is, how can you make the difference between uh, um, this, this kind of flow in which you have uh, uh, con uh, sheets and, and this kind of flow in which you have uh, actual vortices? Um, um, so the, the basic phenomena um, in, 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 in flows with, with uh, rotation is, is the fact that you have inertial waves and, and the fact that the, the inertial waves propagate at, at different frequencies at end of, for, for different angles of propagation. That, that is what, the basic mechanism that creates the, uh, the anisotropy in the flow. And um, this is described in, in, in different works. For instance, Peter Davidson has, uh, has described, the, I, I borrowed the picture here from, from, from him. And um, uh, in magnetic, uh, uh, in, in conductive uh, flows with the magnetic field, you have a similar uh, process that extends the, uh, the stretches the, the structures in, in along the, the magnetic field lines. And the question is, uh, how, how does the uh, isotropy breaking is operated, and how does the flow structure evolve from 3D initial isotropic condition to a 2D and a half or 2D um, uh, um, uh, structure? And, um, uh, and what, what can we use as, f as, as a statistical characterization of this anisotropy uh, of the structure uh, in, 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 in retaining an MHD uh, cases, for instance, and how can we make difference at the statistical level uh, from, um, uh, be between these two kind of flows? Um, and uh, as a side remark, the dispersion is also anisotropic, but I, I'll, I'll stick to the Eulerian description and not the Lagrangian description. Um, so turbulence with rotation um, is, is um, uh, uh, ruled by the, uh, the, the Navier-Stokes equations with the Coriolis term here. Uh, and the important, an important parameter, but it's not the, the only one, and we'll see that later, is the Rossby number, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, is inversely proportional to rotation rate, so that a small Rossby number means a large rotation, and large Rossby number means means um, um, a small rotation. And if you have an MHD flow in that uh, turbulence submitted to um, uh, uh, an external magnetic field, then you, you, you have additional terms here and an induction equation in, in, and, and you have additional uh, parameters, nonlinear parameters, um, sorry, non-dimensional parameters, the LSSM number or the interaction parameter. Um, so um, what do we have when we uh, Cancel the nonlinear term here in, in, this, in, this, in, in th this equation here, and we compute the solution of the flow without the nonlinear terms. And this is a linear approximation, and, and this is wh where we, we see the waves, uh, inertial, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what also about magneto inertial waves. So, um, inertial waves um, are produced by, uh, for instance, in a, in a, in a, in a rotating setting by oscillating, um, um, uh, forcing here uh, uh, a, a, point, uh, a lo point localized force uh, in, in this flow here. And we see the propagation of the waves. And the dispersion law is, is, is very specific because you have um, a frequency of the waves which, which depend only on the orientation of, of propagation. And that is what creates the anisotropy in the flow. Um, and experimentally, th this, these were um, numerical simulations of these, uh, these, these waves. Here is an experimental characterization of these uh, inertial waves. And this is an, another experimental, uh, experimental characterization in which we see the, the fact that the waves are transverse waves so that the, the phase velocity is, is, um, is, is, is goes like that here. Um, so it's a bit different from, from classical waves. Um, in, 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 in the if, if you add uh, a an ex external magnetic field, you, have, um, you can have a mixed magneto inertial waves. Um, for instance, um, here, uh, in the case without magnetic field, we recover the inertial waves. Uh, B is zero, and the rotation rate is, is, is like that. And we ha in that case, we, we, we don't have a harmonic forcing, but we have an impulse uh, force here that generates a, a, a broad frequency of waves so that we have a, a propagation at different angles uh, with respect to the previous case. If you uh, add some mag magnetic field, then you have um, uh, an, 
so, sorry, I'll, I'll just comment on the, on the Alvin waves here. If you have no rotation in the magnetic field, you have propagation of, of, of waves uh, along the, the field lines here. And if you have the mixed case in which you have rotation and, and the magnetic field, then, then you have the intermediate cases in which you, you start, you begin to see the, um, the um, uh, angular uh, direction, specific angular directions of propagation, uh, depending on the, the relative amplitude of the rotation and of the uh, magnetic field here. So these were the, uh, the basic linear mechanisms in, in, in rotating turbulence and MHG turbulence. And here, um, I'm illustrating a weakly nonlinear regime. Unfortunately, I had a very nice um, animation here, but it doesn't work. Uh, but the, 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 the experiment is, is um, a, a torus which is oscillated in, in, a, in a tank uh, of, of fluid at rest. And then uh, you, let it, let the, you put that on a rotating platform, and, and you have a propagation of inertial waves like that like that here, and this is what we see here, the torus, he, torus is here, and at, at, at the apex of the, the, this conical structure here of the propagation of the waves, you observe a patch of turbulence. And depending on the amplitude of the, wave, of, of the, the, the initial uh, generating torus, you can see um, either um, a linear, uh, no interaction between the waves, waves so that uh, uh, linear propagation, they propagate like that, or a weakly nonlinear interaction, and then you have a turbulence patch of, of, of weekly uh, wave, wave turbulence, or um, a, a more turbulence case here. Um, this is illustrated in, in both in, um, in the experiment and in the numerical simulations that agree with, very well with each other. And we see here that if we measure the, ten, the frequency spectra at different points, the, the torus is here, at different points, um, distance, um, at, at a different distance from, from the torus here, uh, we see different s s uh, slopes of the spectra here. And, and uh, the increase, uh, increased slope of the spectra in the, in, at the location of the, uh, the apex here in the turbulence patch means that we, have, we are in the wave turbulence regime. And the, um, the, the, the slope of the spectrum here is not turbulence because it's not minus, minus five four or the equivalent uh, in time, but it's, it's more like minus four. So it's not exactly in that case the uh, turbulence. Um, in, um, in um, the, uh, we, we well, I'll forget about that. Uh, so I'll, I'll move on to the f fully nonlinear regime. And um, in, in that case, um, we, have, we start for, 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 with uh, uh, initial um, uh, turbulence. And then we let the, the flow rotate and, and so that we have two different time scales. We have an eddy turn over time. And we have a linear rotation time scale, which is proportional to the inverse of the rotation rate. And in that case, um, di Considering different structures uh, in the flow, uh, the, the turnover time of the structures is different. And, and if you compare the, edit turn, the, 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 the turnover time of different structures of different times, uh, you can compute a different Rossby number at different scales. So for large scales here, the Rossby number is, is, is small. For intermediate scale, the Rossby number could be of order one. And for small scales, the Rossby number could be, of order of, uh, could be larger than one. So that means that you have differential action of the um, effect of rotation on different scales of the flow. This is the multi-scale uh, anisotropic structure that is produced by, by, by rotation. And we, we want to characterize that. Um, so uh, uh, for instance, we can compute uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a scale which is, or um, a wave number. Uh, which is the inverse of, the, of a length scale, um, which gives the order of magnitude of the scale at which we have a, a separation between, between s uh, large scales affected by rotation and small scales less affected by rotation. And this is the Zeeman uh, wave number or Zeeman scale, which is computed like that from dissipation and, and rotation rate here. And um, this uh, scale is, has been um, found somehow uh, in experiments by, by Corte Moisy. Uh, but this kind of two regimes that can occur in, in the, in the, in, in due to the different scales of the flow that, and, and the different values of the local Rossby numbers have also been found in other wor works. Um, uh, uh, but uh, we wanted to, to have more um, uh, uh, broader range of, of rotation rate and a larger parametric um, study so that um, we did um, uh, several DNS uh, direct numerical simulations with classical pseudospectral uh, method of rotating turbulence with uh, starting with initial um, isotropic com conditions and at different Rossby numbers. So here are the different Rossby numbers, non-rotating case and Rossby number of order one or much smaller than one. 
Um, what we observe uh, in the, the, um, the intermediate resolution result uh, DNS, the 1,000 cube, um, is, is, is the following. We're plotting here the spectra that are accumulated in different orientations. Um, spectra in blue are spectra in the horizontal direction, which means in the, the perpendicular direction perpendicular to the, uh, the, uh, the axis of rotation. Spectra in, 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 in black are spectra along the axis of rotation, and we compute the intermediate spectra as well. In the, in the uh, isotropic case, of, of course, uh, all these spectra collapse. Uh, they, they're all equivalent. If you introduce some rotation, we, we st begin to see the, uh, an, uh, a, a, a trend towards an isotropy in, in, in the large case, but um, this could be uh, hidden in the in the um, in the the numerical something uh, uh, errors or jitter here, not errors but jitter, um, oscillations. Um, if we increase the rotation further, uh, we decrease the Rossby number here. And what I, I plot here in red is the Siemens wave number. So Siemens wave number is here in the isotropic case. It's it's it's, it's zero. Um, in, in, in the moderately rotating case, it's only the very large scales are affected by rotation. In the, in, and when we increase the rotation rate, we observe that an isotropy is gathering uh, towards the smaller, smaller and smaller scales. And what we observe is that we can have a cohabitation between scales that are strongly affected by rotation than that thus strongly anisotropic and scales that are, uh, are uh, recover uh, some kind of isotropy uh, in, in, the, in the smaller dissipative range. But is, this is not due to, to dissipation. It's just the fact that um, we are far from this Zeeman scale here that, and so that we recover uh, isotropy. Um, uh, higher resolution uh, DNS show this kind of, of the same result, but much clearer. Here is the Zeeman scale. Here is the strong anisotropy in the large scales. Here is the recovery of isotropy in the, in the small scales. And if we uh, let the flow rotate very, very fast, then we see that um, the, um, the, uh, the complete spectrum is, 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 is anisotropic, so that the flow is completely anisotropic. And the corresponding physical structure of this accumulation of energy in the equ equatorial plane means that um, here you, have, you observe um, small scales uh, that are isotropic, so that you have turbulent vortices at small scale, the turbulent worms, uh, like in classical isotropic turbulence. But then you have, uh, on top of that, you have a large scale structure, which is anisotropic. Uh, in that case here, all the structures, all the scales are anisotropic. And then we have uh, all the scales that are anisotropic down to the smaller ones. Um, I'll uh, move on to, um, well, this, is con this, this was already observed in, in DNS by, by Stuart DL in, experimentally in Cambridge or in, in lower resolution uh, DNS by, by Yoshimatsu as well. Um, um, and um, what, what, what we want to do, to, what I want to show is that uh, we can have a model decomposition of, uh, of, um, of this kind of uh, creation of anisotropy by separating the flow into uh, a poloidal and a toroidal mode. This is easily done in, um, in uh, spectral space. It's less easy to do that in, 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 in physical space. It's some kind of Helmholtz decomposition. But so that we have both the dependence on the angle, on the, on the direction of the spectra, but also on the fact that if we look at the, at the component which is horizontal or which is poloidal. Um, and so that we have a toroidal contribution and a poloidal contribution to the, uh, the spectra. Um, the, if we, uh, we simple models show that um, accumulation of energy uh, in, this, in, this, um, in this equatorial plane sh show that we have elongated structures like that. Accumulation of en energy in this, in this uh, um, polar region here, uh, axial region, means that we have structures that are uh, like, like um, uh, horizontal structures. Um, um, and uh, if we go further and, and build a, s a small model, kinematic model, using this kind of considerations, and, and, and we can have two, two, uh, two different um, um, uh, uh, um, cases. The case where the toroidal energy is dominant or the case where, where the poloidal energy is dominant. In, in the case where the toroidal energy is dominant, you have vertical eddies, and this is uh, illustrated here. And, and, and there's, the motion is like that. You have vortices and vortices, strong vortices uh, in, uh, actually oriented. Um, and uh, if you have a, a poloidal dominated ca uh, um, uh, 
case in which energy is accumulated in the equatorial plane, in that case you have jetal eddies. And the structure of the flow is different in these two cases. So that, that's a way uh, in term, to, to relate the statistics and the, the spectra here, modal spectra, uh, uh, to the, the structure of the flow. Um, and we observe in, 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 in isotropic turbulence that, of course, the ratio between toroidal and toroidal energy is, is one. Um, something is, 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 is not enough in the small scale so that we have all these oscillations, but it's, it's, it's of order one. Um, if we have a, a flow with intermediate Rossby number, uh, we begin to see a separation between poloidal and toroidal uh, uh, energies. And then if we have a very strong um, uh, rotations, very small Rossby number, then we have a crisis, and that, which means that we have um, a, a dominance of the uh, poloidal energy in the equatorial plane. The equatorial plane is the, the most important because it carries the most energy in the, in the rotating flows, flow. But then we, we see the, the, the fact that uh, we can s separate this kind of flow from this kind of flow um, uh, by looking at the poloidal and toroidal contributions. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip that, but um, uh, the, um, this, this is what we, that, that, we, that permits, what permits to distinguish between um, uh, the um, rotating case and the MHD case, uh, and, and, and the fact that uh, if we look at the uh, equations, se separate equations for um, the uh, poloidal and toroidal difference, which is this variable Z here, I'm going fast, but uh, um, it's just the difference Z is the difference between the poloidal and toroidal spectra. We have this equation, and in the rotating case, the, the linear effect of the inertial waves is, is this term here. Um, in the, uh, for instance, the quasi-static MHD case, uh, the equations are very, very similar. But, but then uh, we have uh, an effect of the um, um, uh, Joule dissipation, both in the Z um, spectrum, which is the difference of the poloidal and toroidal spectra, and in the isotropic spectrum here. So that we see that in rotation, uh, uh, the, the explicit effect of rotation only occurs only happen in this equation on, on the difference for between poloidal and toroidal spectra and not on the uh, isotropic spectrum here, uh, whereas here it happens in, in both. And that explains why in quasi-static MHD we get full uh, two-dimensionalization of the flow. Um, well, it's, 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 it's a part of the explanation, but um, we have full two-dimensionalization of the flow and not in, in rotation. I'm going to, to, to move on to the, the, the question, do we see waves in, um, in, um, in, in turb rotating turbulence? Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to the, the, uh, the analogy between physical and, and spectral space. In, in, in spectral space, we have the Lin equation, the equation for the spectra here, uh, which can depend on the orientation, the, the wave vector, and not only on the wave um, number. So that, that, that's what I showed previously. So you have the uh, unsteady term in the Lin equation, you have the dissipative term, and you have nonlinear transfer uh, of energy between different scales in, 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 in the flow. And then the equivalent of this equation in, in physical space is the common homework monin equation, uh, which um, is uh, an extension of the common, common Howarth equation, which only uh, is written in terms of the modulus of the um, uh, separation between the two points here, the R separation. Here we, we retain the uh, direction of the uh, separation vector as well here. And we look at the different terms. So we also have an unsteady term, we have dissipative term, and we have the equivalent of this term here. This term is not exactly a transfer of energy between scales. It's a transfer of uh, 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 of correlation between between different scales, so we cannot cannot say that this this term here is exactly transfer of energy between scales at given scale r to uh, to another scale r of r prime. It's it's just um, the equivalent of, of, the, of this this term here, and uh, this ter this flux divergence divergence is 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 the uh, is the one which is responsible for the re redistribution of energy. Um, um, so the, the the question is. Uh, um, is there an evidence of inertial waves in, in the full turbulent regime? Um, if we look at the uh, distribution of the, of the flux, uh, this, this flux term here, here is the flux, and here is the divergence of the flux. So the, the sorry, going the wrong, wrong way. Uh, the flux is here, it's the third order moment of the separation vector. In isotropic turbulence, we um, can integrate the equations, the common Howarth equation, and then we, we recover the, the minus four-fifth law or 
different different ways. So that means there's a radial uh, flux of uh, uh, in, in, in in our space. Um, in an isotropic turbulence, in rotating turbulence, we don't have a, this radial flux. The, the flux is, 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 is not radial at all uh, um, uh, anymore. It, it, it has a different, uh, an angle with respect to the, uh, the, 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 the radial orientation. And this is shown here. Even though you, you can't see the, 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 the angle between the, 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 the vectors and, and, and the radii, um, there is a, 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 a difference the, the, the flux is, is not exactly a radial. And uh, what we observe is that from experimental um, data by Moisy, we observe that um, uh, the, the, the flux is, the, the, F, the, com the theta component is of radial term is negative in the large scales, um, uh, sorry, in the small scales. And, um, and w w if we work out the, the wave turbulence theory by, by Galtier, we observe that the, um, the um, uh, flux is, uh, the, the off radial component of the flux is positive, so that the, that's the opposite direction. So what what, what I'm, I'm I'm saying here is that uh, the experimental evidence uh, of of, of the, the, the the flux here, which is uh, not radial, is is means that there we have strong turbulence um, uh, at, at at small scales here, which is consistent with what with what I said previously uh, about. Uh, the real isotropization of the small scales. Whereas, if the flux is like that, is is, is positive. The, this component of the flux is positive. We are consistent with wave turbulence models. I'm not saying it's it's exactly wave turbulence. It's a model, but we are consistent with that. And we observe that in our simulations. If we work out the flux in the previous simulations which I showed, uh, we 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 exactly see these two range, two ranges, large scales. The upper inertial range or the the lower inertial range, in which is less affected by rotation. And this one is, is more affected by rotation. So we have a, a series of, of scales, dissipative scales, um, an intermediate viscous rotating uh, scale. We have the Zeeman scale, and we have large integral length scales that um, um, that separate these different ranges ranges here. So uh, the, this this uh, this evidence of the presence of uh, inertial waves. Uh, in, 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 in rotating turbulence is also uh, demonstrated in, in, in this experiment by Sharon, uh, in which they recover the dispersion relation at, at, at the large, uh, at the small scales here, uh, here, uh, but they don't, don't recover that in the large scales. So the conclusion is, is, is that I'll, I'll, I'll leave it uh, the conclusion here. But the, the, the important thing is that um, the message is that the presence of waves uh, depends on the scales and on the regime. And if you want to characterize that, you need to require a ma macro and micro Rossby numbers, large scale one and a small scale one, or you need to, to compute uh, different scales, a Zeeman scale and maybe a viscous rotation scale as well. Thank you for your attention. Questions? A very nice talk. Uh, I couldn't quite follow what you said about distinguishing between rotating turbulence and MHD turbulence by anisotropy. I would expect rotating turbulence, as you said, to, to recover isotropy at small scales, and MHD turbulence to get progressively more anisotropic at small scales. Is that what you... This is uh, what I and, said. And I your equations... It was quite quick. Uh, yeah, it was quite sorry, quick. Fast, your um, equations showed yeah, the that. the equations sh sh show that. The... the, um, the, the, the this is not a proof that 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 this that that, that MSG turbulence is going to be completely 2D, but uh, it's, it's we see that in the structure of these equations, in, in which the, the the isotropic part of the spectra is the top equations E, and we don't have an, any effect of rotation on 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 on, on this this equation on, on E uh, in the in the rotating case, whereas we have the Joule dissipation in the the quasi-static MSG case. Um, so that uh, even the isotropic part of the spectrum, isotropic, I mean the the, the one which I, I use in my f in the formalism, which decomposes the, the modal energies, um, even this one is going to be uh, um, influenced by by the, uh, the the Joule dissipation. Can I check by quasi-static? You mean low RM? Is that is that yep. what you? Mean? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Pastor, 
energy spectrum of MHD turbulence depend on the PM? Yeah, that, that's that's what uh, what uh, what what uh, what we, we mentioned. The fact that um, we, we, I've always considered in in the in the, the, the simulation either the, the small uh, magnetic Reynolds number uh, limit or the large magnetic Reynolds number limit, and of course there's an influence of the the, 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 the magnetic parental number as well. But this I I, I, I haven't considered that uh, here. Uh, this is not uh, included. It, it's an additional. Of course, it depends, but it's an additional parameter uh, within a, 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 a heavy multi-parametric space already. So we're not considering that uh, at the, for this study. Yes, concerning the, the uh, MHD case, uh, did you get also the decay of the total energy? Because if you say that it becomes two-dimensional, uh, it means the total energy decay should uh, uh, well, come to it's, rest. Well, it's no, it's, de it's decaying. The, the, the flow is decaying. It's, it's, it's unforced turbulence, so that we have an initial condition and then there's dissipation. Anyway, so, so we, lo we lose energy. So the flow is decaying. But if we look at the the, uh, the, the structuration of the flow, the redistribution of energy, uh, there is strong redistribution of energy towards the equatorial plane. That means. Um, uh, motion like that, actual motion, but then uh, this redistribution is is complete in the quasi-static case. You you will end up with having a, a fully, completely 2D uh, uh, turbulent uh, state flow, uh, whereas in the rotating case the limit is, is is not that clear. But if it's 2D in a MHD case, there's no dissipation. dissipation well, ev eventually in 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 in, in, the, in a long time it it is going to be 2D. Yes, but there's no f no flow at all. Then there's no energy. Right, okay. but initially the condition is is three dimensional. Right. Any other? In the main fields, you can have uh, fast and slow waves. It's called magnetic coil waves, fast. And uh, it's the example it shows didn't, didn't sh say it clearly. Maybe maybe the importance, the fast or slow, or doesn't matter in terms of just make a 2D, you know, fast is faster, of course. Well, yeah, we, 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 we it was just a, a very simple um, case in which we, we only have uh, one, one type of wave. And in that case, um, we, we didn't make this distinction. We, no, we were not in the regime in, in, the, in which we had these both, 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 both waves. Uh, phase velocity analysis to, say, uh, to figure out which one, I mean, the magnetized and rotating turbulence case, you should have both sort of fast magnetic coil waves and the slow coil. Both have different speeds, different spread, different case. No, it can well, as a matter of fact, what, what was interesting to us is, is where, 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 where rotation was strong, so that the, 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 the most important thing was the anastrophic propagation of the waves. Okay, so up next we have Yoshifumi uh, Kimura from Nagoya University speaking on the interaction of vortices and waves in rotating stratified turbulence.
first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a nice uh, opportunity to present the uh, talk. Uh, so this is a joint work with Jack Herring. And first, the motivation is, uh, well, uh, if we forget about rotation, or actually not forget, uh, put the rotation aside for a while, then uh, there are two distinct uh, 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 vortices in stably stratified turbulence. One is uh, zigzag, well, uh, produced by zigzag instability by Bion and Shamas. Uh, uh, actually, zigzag vortices are produced from a large scale, starting from uh, vertical uh, columnar vortices. Uh, the other one is, uh, uh, well, so-called scattered pancakes, uh, produced from small scales, starting from random in, uh, isotropic vortices. Well, actually, one naive question is, are they really different objects? And to answer these, this naive question is uh, one of the motivations uh, of my talk today. So, uh, to do that, uh, uh, we crank up Navier-Stokes equation with the Business approximation. Equation is uh, familiar already, perhaps. Uh, uh, here, u is vorticity, uh, sorry, velocity, and theta is the temperature fluctuations. And uh, by using the uh, business approximation, n square here is uh, uh, brandt weissler frequency or buoyancy frequency. And we put the external forcing uh, in Fourier space. So numerical methods are summarized as, as this. Uh, it's a forced simulations and two pi periodic box with uh, uh, either from, well, 1024 cubic to tw uh, 2048 cubic grid points. And uh, the matching time scale, time matching is the third order Lunge Kata. And the initial energy spectrum uh, is zero. So we force, uh, we develop structures just by external forcing. Uh, we force uh, horizontal velocity components. And uh, forcing is uh, not uh, random, just the white noise, but uh, some integrated uh, uh, white noise, so-called uh, red or pink noise. Uh, and just to put the forcing wave number, small band in a forcing wave number four or 10. And we use two different forcing. Uh, one is quasi 2D and uh, the other one is pure 2D, which we, we, I will explain now. And uh, the two types of 2D forcing is first uh, uh, quasi 2D is we force uh, just the horizontal uh, U and V, but uh, these components of uh, a function of uh, Kx, Ky, Kz both. So uh, we force component, well, forcing may, may differ vertically. So uh, which is either 2D, even 2D, but uh, inputting some seed of gravity waves. So instead of this quasi 2D forcing, we use, uh, uh, today we, we, I, I present the result just using pure 2D. Pure 2D is uh, forcing which, has, which force just uh, U and V, but uh, they are components of just Kx and Ky. So Kz equals zero, which means uh, uniform in uh, the Z direction. So, so gravity waves are generated by just by coupling between velocity and temperature fluctuations. So to analyze velocity field, we, uh, we use uh, uh, so-called Cryer-Helling decomposition, which is similar to the previous uh, uh, speaker's uh, toroidal poloidal decomposition, and uh, for which the, the idea is very simple. Uh, incompressibility is uh, written by this uh, in Fourier space. So you uh, component is perpendicular to uh, wave vector k. So so u is spanned by two independent vector in uh, pa perpendicular to k. So we uh, using this uh, uh, one k e one e two e three. Uh, which makes uh, orthogonal coordinates, and we expand UK in using just e, e, E1 and E2. That's a toroidal and the poloidal decomposition. 
And uh, if we uh, calculate the <coughs> coefficient of phi one just by uh, uh, multi Producting using product of E1 with e UK, we can calculate the, uh, using uh, 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 components, which gives uh, uh, phi1 is uh, uh, just a, a vertical uh, a vorticity. So we call this phi1 as vertical. While phi2, if we do the same game, uh, which is proportional to uh, w, uh, so W is, uh, again, it's an it's a oscillating part. So we call this uh, phi2 wavy part. So this is a result of uh, growth of phi1 and phi2 energy uh, with time. And uh, n square equal 10 and 100. And forcing wave number is 4, these two, and forcing number is 10. So for all cases, I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, weird, but uh, uh, phi1, phi1 is this. Uh, so horizontal component, uh, sorry. And we switch on stratification at this time. So until then, it's just a pure 2D flow. And then we switch on stratification. And for all cases, uh, uh, so phi2 is a wave component. Wave component grows very rapidly, almost with exponent, uh, exponential uh, growth. So uh, the uh, exponent changes, dif uh, becomes different uh, because we have a different number of nodes and the different amplitude. But the uh, exponential feature is all the same or phi1 and phi2 developing. Wow. So uh, if we look at the uh, uh, growth of uh, uh, phi1 and phi2 with energy spectra, it's like this. Let me change. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, this is a, 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 a time zone from 0 to uh, 22.79. So this, mainly this, this region. So at first, the energy spectrum, 2D, uh, phi1 energy spectrum, uh, I'm showing just the phi1 spectra. And phi1 spectra shows a, a nice, uh, uh, so this is wave forcing wave number. And the uh, largest scale than forcing wave number shows uh, minus 5 third. And uh, below, it's, it's a minus 4, or a little bit shallower than minus 4. So between minus 4 and minus, two, minus 3. So, uh, 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 and then after that, uh, after phi 2, wave component becomes a, a, a kind of developed. Then, uh, 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 so this is a T to 22.84 from here to uh, 48, 45, so this region. So then uh, the energy spectrum is, uh, uh, first it's 2D-like, but then uh, uh, some flat spectra is observed in the small, uh, larger scale. And some kind of tendency is minus one spectra in the high wave number. And uh, so this is C region is here. Is after that, uh, uh, both phi1 and phi2 becomes uh, 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 almost stationary and uh, small changes in the uh, energy spectra. So we can observe minus five third in the high wave number. and. Uh, uh, small, uh, uh, a large scale is uh, even flatter than this. Actually, the uh, flat spectra in the low wave number numbers were uh, reported originally by Herring and Mete, and recently verified by Marino, uh, Medini, Rosenberg, and Puke. So, it's about the, the how uh, spectra develops uh, according to the 
exchange of V1 energy and V2. So if we look at the uh, development of horizontal layers, so again, using the same uh, 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 energy growth, and uh, uh, so this time, uh, it's very bizarre, sorry. Uh, uh, actually, there's no change. It's, a, it's a just a 2D. So this is an average of kinetic energy in a horizontal plane. And this is a Z coordinate. And no big difference, no change at all. It's a vertically the uniform at this time. But after that, uh, 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 so vertical energy distribution becomes uh, weakly uh, uh, at T point uh, 25 is this point, and T point 30 is this point at, at this time. So uh, 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 already some weekly, very uh, uh, kind of periodic uh, uh, structures are developed. And after that, no big change at all. Actually, uh, so the energy decreases, decays phi, both phi1 and phi2. So amplitude becomes smaller, but the structures are almost the same. So uh, I, I, I would say that uh, it's a little bizarre. Well, actually, it's not seen very. So this rapid growth of uh, phi2 region produces uh, these uh, 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 layers in the horizontal. So to explain uh, uh, the development of uh, uh, pancakes from uh, uh, vertical layers or vertical vortices, well, using uh, low fluid number limit model by Riley, Metcalf, and Weissman uh, many years ago. So actually, Maida, anti Maida, and Grote, uh, they pro uh, presented uh, some linear advection diffusion equation. Eventually, the same equation with this. But using a special initial condition, they uh, uh, presented uh, some analytical solutions. And uh, if we, uh, so, well, these are two uh, vertical columns of vortices. So then it produces some uh, pancakes. So it's a tilted pancakes. But if we uh, uh, integrate that equation longer, that uh, tilted pancakes begin to move. Uh, and finally presented, uh, uh, produced such kind of wedge type vortices. So it's a li linear, linear advection diffusion equation. But still, we can find such interesting structures. Okay, so now uh, if we impose rot uh, rotation as well as stratification, so uh, this is a, a effect of rotation. So only preliminary. I, I present the preliminary result with a, a five twelve cubic, and uh, rotation is zero, is as, as shown before. And if we increase rotation, uh, so. Uh, uh, the phi one development of phi one energy, uh, horizontal energy and vertical waves uh, are shown. Uh, and uh, uh, with higher and higher rotation, uh, wave amplitude becomes smaller and smaller, decreases. But the growth rate here is almost the same. So uh, at the n square equal 100 and then, uh, omega square equal 100, so it's both. Uh, uh, low fluid number and low uh, res uh, radi uh, low Rosby number case. Uh, so we expect that the state is uh, fluidly geostrophic. And uh, if we look at the de development of phi one with time, so uh, we pick up uh, uh, these four. Is the next uh, slide, and this is with time, and uh, uh, phi one develops 
uh, with uh, no rotation, so de uh, decays like this and becomes stationary. And with uh, higher and higher rotation, so phi one development becomes uh, weak, uh, decrease is weaker and weaker. And finally, this dotted line is just for pure 2D. So uh, as long as we look at uh, uh, phi one energy, so increase rotation becomes state flow state more, more and more 2D. So it may be an interesting, interesting uh, uh, thing uh, how we can apply the uh, classical chromograph theory to explain those kind of things. And this is a review of uh, classical homogeneous isotropic case. And for uh, uh, homogeneous isotropic case is uh, uh, the TK as uh, explained in the previous uh, by the previous speaker uh, Fabian. Uh, so it's a spectral average of energy transfer function. And if we integrate the uh, energy transfer function, we can uh, we can define so-called the flux function. And the the basic idea of the chromograph is constant flux is a power law in spectrum and uh, which present the uh, inertial range. And so this is a schematic uh, uh, view of uh, flux function. And uh, uh, at the forcing wave number, it becomes uh, uh, either positive or negative by the definition. And then states, so uh, uh, the constant flux, this region we define uh, so-called inertial range. And it go back, goes back to zero because of the symmetry of the wave space. So if we calculate the, uh, uh, to calculate the uh, transfer function, so this is, uh, the, again, the energy budget equation in Fourier space. And if we integrate uh, by those terms, we can calculate the uh, 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 energy transfer and flux functions. And this is a result of uh, flux functions uh, with time. So uh, at the earlier time, uh, uh, again, using the same uh, uh, diagram, same development growth uh, picture. And uh, earlier time, the flux is uh, less, just developed uh, in the lower wave number than forcing wave number. So it's, uh, the state is more like 2D. But then, uh, after that, the flux function becomes uh, our changes. And uh, uh, this uh, underlined time, uh, uh, so the changes become bigger and bigger, and 22.58, uh, so this region. And, uh, and, uh, and up to 25.91, so again, in a small, very small region, time slot, uh, when uh, waves becomes dominant or are not no, developed, then we see big difference, uh, characteristic difference, qualitative difference in the uh, energy flux function. And finally, it becomes uh, rather different from uh, the 2D case. So, uh, well, energy flux function with different wave numbers means, uh, so the, for the previous case, I showed, the, I just showed the uh, wave number, total wave number K, but if we look at the uh, K perp, which is horizontal wave number and uh, 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 vertical wave number, we have different uh, features in the flux functions. So flux functions in terms of k horizontal and k z do not go back to zero exactly uh, in high wave numbers because they, the energy conservation is not hold completely for these uh, cases. So gravity waves uh, phi two receive energy from phi one. So uh, 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 the 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 total becomes zero, but the phi one flux and the phi two flux becomes positive and negative. So gravity waves receives uh, energy from phi one uh, in the high wave number region and contribute for energy dispersion. So uh, anyway, the only uh, 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 energy flux goes to zero is a total. 
energy. So, uh, 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 next, uh, w whether we can apply th that kind of chromographs idea to predict the inertial range or uh, 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 something like that. So, using the uh, uh, K, total K, and which, so this region is almost nearly uh, 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 constant for phi 1 and phi phi 1 and phi 2 and uh, 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 total energy. So we plotted the energy spectra uh, in the spherical shell. So this is not the horizontal wave number, but the spherical wave number, three-dimensional wave number. So then uh, some nice uh, 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 power law, in the, but the power law is k to the minus 5 halves or something like that. So energy flux for phi 1 takes nearly a constant value in the high wave number region. And phi 1 energy, phi 2 energy, potential energy together all satisfy conservation of energy. And uh, corresponding energy spectrum satis satisfies a certain constant power law. Uh, but the problem is phi 1, phi 2 both tend to uh, be 0. Well, actually, actually phi 1. Uh, 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 The region of high wave number. Yes, there is no theoretical re uh, reason uh, for k to the minus five halves. So, uh, using uh, uh, well, uh, k. Uh, so k is this is total k, and th this is kz, uh, uh, kz spectra. So vertical spectra shows uh, uh, minus. Uh, three in the high wave number, but uh, as we remember, the energy sorry. so again the uh, 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 flux function is completely different from uh, 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 original Kolmogorov's idea. So, but still, uh, we find uh, some uh, uh, nice, well, k to the minus 3. And actually, that energy spectra, uh, kz is a function of kz minus 3, is known as a saturation spectrum and often observed in, the, in ocean science. So, uh, the summary is horizontal layers develop quickly as the wave component grows. And uh, rotation decreases the amplitude of waves, uh, keeping the growth rate almost similar. Kolmov's cascade picture needs to be modified because of the anisotropy. Thank you for your attention. So I uh, I, I, I think uh, it's a, it's a, uh, the, I, I believe it's a similar to uh, the same thing. Other questions? Sorry, I, I basically a question about your computation. Uh, so n is buoyancy frequency. If n is constant, that means the stratification has the exponential profile. Uh, stratification? Has the exponential profile for constant buoyancy frequency. Is it true? Well, stratification, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Not exponential. It, and it's d rho dz divided by rho. So uh, uh, rho square of the, n square is the d rho dz divided by rho. So. Uh -huh. If n is constant, stratification has an exponential profile. Uh, well, so actually, uh, n squared is, so I, we use business approximation. So uh, it's constant the slope uh, plus uh, fluctuation. OK, even that. So can you use the periodical boundary condition ah, in yeah, a vertical yeah, yeah. axis? That's yeah, my question. Yes. Right. So, uh, so we are solving just for uh, 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 fluctuations. 
So the equation is uh, uh, with with uh, linear uh, 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 part. So if we solve just for fluctuations, we can use uh, periodic boundary condition even in the z direction. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. So actually, we are not uh, solving to you know Kolmogorov uh, uh, scale. So it's Kolmogorov is scale is much much higher uh, wave number. But still, we can have some steady uh, uh, calculation. So which means uh, I predict that uh, wave uh, you know dissipation there's kind of wave dissipation mechanism which stays uh, keeps uh, computation going. Uh, can you comment on whether your results are consistent with Limborg's results? So he has a, a, a spectrum of minus five third with a horizontal wave number and minus three. You, you got the minus three with a vertical wave number. Do you, do you find the same spectrum? Horizontal uh, wave number? Uh, I, I, uh, th does he produce minus three for the vertical spectrum? Uh, yeah. So yes, that's the same thing, I think. What about with the horizontal wave? Horizontal number? is a minus he only sticks to minus five third. Yeah, mine is minus five third for a uh, 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 high wave number. Uh, no, no, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Yoshi, I, I missed it, but did you include thermal diffusion or not for the temperature equation? For the temperatures, thermal diffusion, yes. And so what was the Pronto number? The Pronto number is one. One, okay, thank you. And did you look at other values of the Pronto number? Oh. Or? Why not? Anyone else? Okay, well, that concludes the morning session. We'll see everyone back at 2 p.m.